welcome to today's episode of marvelous medicine which is about improving uh, the quality of uh, perioperative care um, we are very much uh, privileged to have uh, dr ajay kumar sharma who will be speaking on the topic he is a consultant surgeon and honorary senior lecturer at uh, royal liverpool university hospital uh, liverpool uh, he did his mbbs and ms general surgery from the all india institute of medical sciences new delhi he is a diplomat of the national board a fellow of the royal college of surgeons of glasgow and edinburgh and he has done msc in medical education he is also the deputy director surgical education of uh, royal college of physicians and surgeons of glasgow he has 185 publications and seven book chapters to his credit like he mentioned earlier his uh, soul is in india so he is a visiting professor of surgery at aims rishikesh a national educator for atls india and he does this acute critical care course for clinicians and he has done he and his team have done 66 provider courses and 19 instructor courses here he is also involved in several online teaching and training programs for trauma care and transplant which he conducts online and connects to more than 30 countries thank you so much dr ajay sharma for uh, immediately accepting our invitation and uh, taking time out despite it being the wrong time of the day in the united kingdom uh, mm -hmm. moder moderating the session will be dr pc vijay kumar he is the chief anesthesiologist and a critical care physician and director of academics at surya hospital chennai dr vijay kumar did his mbbs from chengalpet medical college and a da and dnb anesthesiology from madras medical college he is currently the president of the iapn uh, india and has always been very much interested in uh, perioperative care and nutrition he runs an ngo uh, called sipi charitable trust which helps hiv and cancer patients he is a very much sought after speaker uh, at various national and international conferences and we are really lucky to catch him uh, and uh, he has agreed to be the moderator for this session thank you so much dr vijay kumar over to you dr ajay yeah so shall i request dr vijay kumar to uh, say a few words uh, see why uh, you know in his opinion perioperative care is so important uh, you know most of the surgeons uh, we focus on oh uh, doing surgery is uh, everything of course it is very important part of in the patient journey but perioperative care uh, hardly any surgeon certainly in my country india um, there's lack of formal training program in providing perioperative care so shall we have his views before we before i start yeah yes sir absolutely absolutely so first of all i like to thank the marvelous medicine group for giving me this opportunity to chair this session on the topic perioperative care so this morning when i opened the facebook i was seeing dr patar radha krishna's post inviting the people to come for this particular evening the discussion and he was narrating all his experiences as a senior surgeon for the last 25 to 30 years of his experience about the perioperative care and if anybody had an opportunity to go through that particular post in the facebook they might have had some introduction about this topic in this evening so he narrated his history or the his experiences in the perioperative care by being an anesthesiologist the experience of 30 years and i am lucky enough to act as a perioperative physician in the very same hospital for the last 27 years so i had seen the two generation of general surgeons or any other surgical colleagues one is a senior people and now after a decade many in surgeons come on operating me utilizing our perioperative care so as an anesthesiologist when i took up this specialty as dr patta narrated the job of anesthesiologist it ends the moment the patient opens his eyes and had a good recovery and handed over the handing over the patient to the perioperative care and we stop at that particular level but now we have moved far away and we started contributing so much for the perioperative care of the patients it is a teamwork because no one can claim whether the surgeon or the anesthesiologist whomever it may be the physicians 
and also the staff nurses, physiotherapists, it's a team. So this team has to contribute well enough to the perioperative care of a surgical patient to improve the quality of perioperative care. Because most of the time we all think the moment the surgery is over, patient is going to have its recovery on its own. So that is not the quality perioperative care. If you want to increase your quality, we have to concentrate on each and every aspects. So 15 years before, when I gave the lecture on the enhanced recovery after surgical procedures, many people don't know what, what we really mean by ERAS. But even after 15 years of ringing the bell, look and corner about the protocols involved in enhanced recovery after surgical procedure, even today, we are not able to follow the entire bundle in India. And when I worried about the Indian experiences, when I discussing with the European, I hope Dr. Ajay also will accept, no center is able to fulfill the entire protocols or the entire bundles of the ERAS guidelines. So in India also, it's very difficult. Even we are not able to convince my own colleagues, anesthesiologists on these bundles. And I'm not able to convince my surgical colleagues about certain protocols. And even after 15 years of my perioperative care experience, the quality of perioperative care is almost, we can say that it is not up to the mark in our country. So the moment I heard about this particular topic with the title, add on that, that is the quality improvement. So everybody in this crowd is accepting that we need to improve the quality of perioperative care for our surgical patients. So among the three important factors which can increase the recovery of our surgical patients, I put the three important factors. One is the pain relief, and another one is the early mobility, and the third one is the strength of the patient. To improve the strength, we have to concentrate on the perioperative nutrition. So the perioperative nutrition being as a personnel who is interested in this particular field and heading an association, the Pen Society of India, IAPN India, I like to concentrate more on this third aspect, the perioperative nutrition, which can send the surgical patients home. At the same time, we can send the patient at the early to the work. For the surgical patient, it is not the important that they have to get discharged from the hospital. They have to go back to the original work with a good quality of life. For that, we need to preserve the muscle strength of an individual. And for that, we have to start preparing them from the pre-operative period throughout the perioperative period. With this introduction, i like to hear more from Dr. Ajay and over to Dr. Ajay. Uh, thank, uh, thank you very much. Uh... Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Vijay Kumar. And uh, um, can I uh, just for a moment request uh, Dr. Professor Geeta Shetty from Birmingham. Her contribution to perioperative training in India uh, has been immense uh, and you in UK as well. Uh, so, uh, and also Dr. Shiv Singh, if they can really say a few words because Geeta Shetty has contributed immensely to perioperative care and also my colleague in Liverpool, Shiv Singh, who is uh, who has got a big, huge empire of 35,000 people in his, uh, you know, the uh, NSHS uh, training and teachers group. And he has inspired us to do quite a lot. Uh, we can say that. So maybe Geeta and Shiv, if you can just say a few words and we'll get going. Hello, everyone. And uh, thank you very much for having me today. I'll try to be there for the most of the meeting in case if I go a little bit early, then I apologize. Okay. Um, well, I don't want to dwell on what already Dr. P.C. Vijay Kumar has talked about, the perioperative care importance in the surgical field, not necessarily surgical field, in any medicine field, I would say. Okay. Now, coming to the point who looks after these patients? Who are the people who are going to be giving this perioperative care? It is our juniors. They are there in and out on duty, okay, on call 
first to attend these patients who are in need. And we all, everyone agree that the first few minutes, first hour, first couple of hours are so important for patient to bring them out of their critical condition to reduce the morbidity and mortality of these patients. By the time they talk to the seniors, already this time has lapsed. Mm -hmm. So we have to equip these guys who is going to be delivering this care at the ground, at the grassroots level. So how we can equip them very well is one by the simulations, you know, introducing the skill-based development. You know, not we, we, we cannot assume that every junior is competent with the skill-based development. Every junior is competent with giving, you know, prescribing the medication as it would be needed. For example, the morphine, which can produce, you know, the... A perioperative arrest with a respiratory thing. So you, you, they cannot wait until the seniors come and give the naloxon. They need to know what they have to do then and there. Otherwise, the patient will be gone. Okay. So these are the things what Doc, uh, Professor Ajay Kumar Sharma is going to talk about the skill-based development of this program, what he's going to be introducing to us in the, at the grassroots level, which will help to reduce the morbidity and mortality of these patients. So I think I have spoken enough. Now I will Thank give you. a chance to Professor uh, Ajay Kumar Sharma. To Gita, take amazing, the your contribution is amazing. Uh, I can say that. Uh, not many people would know that, but yeah. Uh, now come, let's try this. No, take uh, English. Shiv is apparently uh, not feeling too well, but uh, I have to thank Shiv for uh, uh, you know linking okay. you with uh, ah, okay. Ramana Krishna and okay. thereby to me, and uh, that's how we are having you no, on no. today. And uh, uh, so, uh, the, uh, uh, Dr. Girijada Sharma, a very uh, what should I say, passionate teacher and somebody who believes in. Uh, full perioperative care is also logged in uh, today. Uh, Sharma, sir, any words from you before Dr. Ajay starts his talk? Dr. Girija, uh, that Sharma. Yeah, good evening, everybody. I am yes, a sir. trauma and journal surgeon involved in teaching. See, my, my thought process is the ideal situation is to have a perioperative team in every hospital, which might take a few more years till the elderly surgeons get convinced that somebody else has to manage better. Till such time, see the, the, the real bottleneck is elderly guys think they know everything, whereas they don't. The, the best example which I find is that an elderly lady with multiple disease processes is always admitted with fracture femur under perioperative team. In America, they also call it optimization team. The orthopods are involved on day four when they find everything is well, they come fix their metal and next day remove the drain and get lost. It is, see, it is a speciality. We have to understand somebody with that mental bent of mind. A lot of us know a lot of things, but to put in the right perspective at the right time on the right patient is what is going to make the outcome difference. So my philosophy is though even in the best hospitals with all the super specialists available at no time on morning rounds, all of them are together. The diabetologist will see at 11 a.m., primary team at 9 a.m., the orthopods will come at 12, the respiratory guy will come at one. So it is all hodgepodge. There should be one fellow responsible for everything who should be able and who should be trained to manage common issues right on the spot till the expert comes. I think that's my take. Uh, let uh, let yeah. the speaker suggest. Yeah, thank you, much, Dr. Girida Sharma and uh, Dr. Vijay Kumar and Geeta. Uh, as you have very clearly pointed out, the care is very fragmented. And of course, uh, some of many of these problems uh, patients will not be able to wait. So uh, why I'm going to talk about uh, the 
how we can really improve uh, quality of uh, perioperative care, why, what, and how. These are some of the issues I'm going to discuss. So uh, uh, recently we conducted uh, our 64th course. After that, we had two more, one at Max and another at AIMS Delhi. And this was the course uh, we did at uh, Air Force Medical College Pune. And uh, because of the might of Indian Army, their immense resources, uh, we could have, uh, uh, you know, 25% of the uh, participants were uh, from civil hospitals. And we could really uh, do that on the invitation of Ministry of Defense. So uh, I'm going to really talk about why Army uh, is really so interested and why how can there be an immense role for army and civilian cooperation in achieving uh, what we should really achieve in perioperative care? So uh, ideally, we should really be interacting here, but somehow since there's so much of so much to go through, so let's just really show some of the evidence uh, which we have been able to really gather. The need for simulation-based uh, training program for uh, managing surgical patients, and uh, so yeah. Just seeing how it is really changing. Oh, yeah. And uh, we, in 2014, we implemented acute critical care course for uh, surgeons. Uh, I'm just going to really mention this uh, slide. This was uh, published in American College of Surgeons. Uh, it says that the best surgeons have mentors. Uh, and it really talks about the quality of uh, a, an ideal surgeon. Of course, uh, we all, for the last 30, 40 years, have been really very impressed by some of the uh, surgeons who have had good outcomes because of their skills, precision, precision, and simplicity. And uh, you know, if something is really simple to do, it looks good. Probably the results would be good. But very often we forget that operation. Of course, is the most. Uh, it is really the very critical phase in the patient journey. But it is actually the periodic care, the human factors which really uh, are so crucial. I would really give the example of uh, um, this patient, uh, which I saw as an intern in 1985. In the, uh, Ajay, the your, your slides are not on screen. You have to share your screen. Uh, can you not see these slides? No, no not yet. You have to share. Oh, oh my God. <laughs> okay, I thought I, <laughs> my God, my apologies. Okay, let me see how I can, oh yeah, yeah, okay. My apology. I thought I had shared it, but uh, oh, here we go. So, can we see the slides now? Yeah, yes, sure. Okay, thanks for pointing that. My goodness, I was under wrong impression. Okay, here we go. So, we are going to talk about uh, uh, why there is an importance, uh, why it is so critically important for us to make sure that we all have got uh, decent training in providing perioperative care. So th this is some of the uh, publications which have emanated from this. And this slide shows uh, uh, the qualities of a good surgeon. I, I know uh, it says best surgeon, but uh, I'm happy to be just a good one, providing good perioperative care. And uh, all I'm trying to say is that uh, it is very crucial for us to really have uh, uh, not just the technical skills, uh, but we are doctors first, surgeons later, to make sure that uh, these patients are managed safely. One in 10 uh, most important errors which do happen in the hospital cause of uh, uh, um, problem is uh, really the medical errors. We don't leave home, we don't leave hostel to come to the hospital so that the patients really come to harm. It just there is a significant, there's a serious flaw in our training. Uh, I know the, um, uh, you know, just same that I'm just not able. Can you see this slide now? Is this slide changing? Yes, yes, we can. Yeah, the seven leadership behaviors. Yeah. Okay. Uh, this is what I uh, really am just quoting from my training in Royal Military Academy centers where I was went there for getting trained as a soldier, and. Uh, I would say that they lead by example, encourage thinking, apply reward and discipline, demand high performance, and encourage confidence in the team, and recognize strengths and weaknesses, and strive for team goals. I call it Sanders' style of teaching and training. I really believe that this style is really very much applicable to surgical uh, training as well. 
and I'll come to that uh, why I'm mentioning that. Uh, I was really, uh, I'm talking about uh, when I was an intern in 1985, I was posted with Ramin Mittal uh, at All in Night Topper in uh, All in Night Board and uh, uh, with me were VM Ready and Why We're Off. And we thought we were a fantastic team in uh, research studying patients. But what happened was that uh, there was a patient who was only 23 or 24 year old. He slipped from DTC bus and he was brought in and uh, he had fracture of femur. And uh, we sent a call to the orthopedic uh, registrar, please come and fix the bone. And that was 5 p.m. At 8 p.m., we went for handover and this patient was dead. And uh, do we really need to have an orthopedic registrar, or orthopedic consultant to save this patient? No. Even simple transplant surgeon like me, anybody who suffers a gynecologist or a physician can stabilize patient's uh, uh, limb by uh, using either, either a splint or if there's no splint, you can just fix it to the other uh, uninjured leg and give him two liters of fluid. He would have been alive, uh, you know, at this age of almost 60 or 61, he would have been now. And that time, I really realized that these are simple measures which are really needed in for these patients to save them from going from ward to the HDU, from HDU to ITU. And uh, just only four years ago, I called my daughter. That was uh, sometime in July, uh, four years ago. Oh, Devina, good luck for your uh, for your internship. Uh, I like this profession, and uh, I'm sure you'll do well. She said, Papa, I cannot do it. I cannot start it unless I show them the certificate of BLS, ALS, and ACLS. So I realized something really uh, lacking Although uh, the knowledge of uh, our medical graduates in India is far ahead of uh, the uh, UK graduates, I'm very confident in saying that, but uh, the skills in saving these patients who are sick, identifying them and saving them, uh, there's a lack of training there. Of course, we keep learning over a period of time by making errors and uh, learning from those mistakes, but uh, ideally we should have systems in place that we are able to save these patients uh, doing these courses whether it is ACC or CRISP course which inspired us to uh, to really be uh, conceptualized and implemented in India uh, in two days nobody can become critical care specialist it takes six years of hard work three years as a junior agent, three years as a senior agent, and then you can say oh yeah I know about critical care so certainly in two days it is impossible but certainly what we are very sure, whether it is ATLS, managing trauma patients within Golden Hour, or CRISP course, managing peripheral patients, uh, training uh, is given in the UK, which is uh, almost compulsory for all the surgical trainees, and ACC, which uh, I'm really going to talk about what we have really been able to achieve. So uh, I'm just quoting that previous one. It says that best surgeons know that human factors are as important as technical skills. And this is the course I'm talking about. And one of the pictures from Jan Swastas Hayog in central India, in tribal area, where this, uh, in 2012, we implemented this course, we designed and developed that initially. And one of those pictures that we really need to have team working as, uh, uh, you know, Dr. Vijay Kumar emphasized, as uh, 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 highlighted by uh, Professor Gita Shetty. Working as a team is so crucial. I'll give you some examples. Uh, we, as surgeons, we, of course, focus on learning anatomy, which is a very important part of our exam as our repertoire, as different uh, in our different surgical specialties. But very often we fail to realize that it is actually the applied physiology principles which are so crucial in managing these patients. Two out of 10 examiners in final FRCS would examine you in applied physiology and critical care. Uh, and uh, they may be fantastic senior you know, registrars, and if they are not able to pass uh, those two out of ten examiners, they won't be able to become consultant. You have got only three chances. Any comment on that, uh, Geeta, about the perioperative care and the need for it uh, in the surgical training program? Maybe I'll wait for a little later then. So, uh, 
it is very important for us to realize that it is we all need to have systems in place that we keep learning from errors, from mistakes. Uh, as I said, one of the top 10 killers around the world anywhere is uh, errors, medical errors. But I can say that a large number of them are very much preventable. So this is one of those pictures I uh, took when we were conducting the course, my guru, Professor Ayam Kapoor. And uh, it is really important to get, you know, relate with the patient, develop a bond. The only bond which is stronger than bond between doctor and a patient is, uh, is bond between mom and a child. Otherwise, no other bond can really, really surpass that. If we have got good bond, we keep talking to patient, keep writing, and we are in really such a privileged position that we are the only professionals in the world wherein patients come and really uh, express their uh, flaws, deficiencies. Uh, so, Geeta, can you make a comment on that? Uh, about uh, communication, the need for uh, the need for applied physiology and critical care principles? Geeta? Uh, Dr. Geeta, you're muted. You need to unmute yourself. Okay, no problem. I'll keep going. Uh, we have really... Just... Yeah, sorry. So sorry about that. I'm, I'm really sorry. Okay, a little bit of glitch in the computer. I hope you can hear me now. Um, yeah, communication is something I think which have been uh, not very well developed uh, in our system. Even when I was uh, uh, at an MBBS level and even at MS level, communication is something we always took granted and took that patient, whatever we do, you know, um, that the patient are willing to accept. But the things have changed now. I think they want to know each and everything that will, in fact, help them to reduce the anxiety and uh, the prepare them for the future consequences. What happened to the patients for in an emergency department, you know, yeah, already uh, Professor Ajay Kumar Sharma has spoken or he will be going to speak about it. The small burst of communications, which are very, very important when the patient is born very unwell, is an important. That will prepare the family as well as patient. If a patient can understand what is happening to, the, you know, happening to him or her, you know, for the further consequences, what is going to come next? They bring the patient, you do everything, come out and say, we did everything, the patient could not be survived. That doesn't go probably well. If you keep on started to say that, you know, even taking the trolley inside, the patient is very unwell. We will do what we can, you know, and we'll keep you informed as and when we, you know, if there is any uh, changes happen to the patient. That will help them to prepare themselves for the further consequences. This is what about the communication. This is about the emergency component of the communication. We are not talking about, you know, the, the, the communications, what we deal with the oncological issue or any chronic illness. That is completely different type of communications, what we have. This is the two types of communication, small burst of communication and how we conduct the communication in a chronic illness or in oncological issue. So um, as he already showed you, uh, Professor Ajay Kumar Sharma, that we have published a paper on short burst of communication with the AIMS group of guys, which has really helped to reduce the anxiety of the patient as well as the family. Yes, sir. Yeah, I'm just saying that uh, even for, you know, when you're talking about uh, breaking the bad news, telling about the cancer or any significant development, it doesn't really take more than seven or eight minutes of focused time if we follow the simple principles of SPIKES model, if we have had training through SPIKES model, S-P-I-K-E-S, uh, then we all are really quite, uh, you know, well, not always comfortable, but we do have training and that training really matters a lot. And we talk about, uh, you know, uh, especially I can say it's more of a problem in North India, violence against doctors. 
but it can be there in any other part of India. The uh, I must say that to some extent, uh, uh, we doctors are responsible for not really training our younger colleagues in communication skills. And uh, all I'm trying to say is that whether it is ATLS course or ACC, there's a, quite a lot of focus on developing good communication skills. That's what I'm trying to say. Again, in one hour, it is impossible to really cover that. Uh, this is one of those pictures which I you can see the date on it when I went to uh, Stanley Medical College in Madras and uh, in uh, February, March of 88, I worked in hand and foot reconstructive surgery with uh, Professor R. Venkata Swami and he signed this logbook. I still have that. Uh, so even though I'm not a hand surgeon, but I can still say that the kind of training he provided, if I'm stuck somewhere in remote areas, I would not really mind, you know, doing some flaps. Of course, if there is some better surgeon, let him or her do it. All I'm trying to say is that the need for logbook. Uh, how many of us are there in uh, this, uh, if I can really, uh, in the chat box, uh, if you can really reply, how many of you have had uh, training in, uh, uh, in communication skills, number one, and how many of you maintain logbook if you can just say yes and no about that uh, i'll be grateful and we'll add we'll discuss that a little later so need for uh, the training in uh, communication number two the need for logbook and as i really showed that picture initially uh, let me just go back to that slide when Professor M. M. Kupur really uh, emphasized on need for keeping the records. If we can really keep learning from uh, our previous uh, records, then we can really keep improving, keep learning from errors. And I'm quoting this uh, picture from Edinburgh, uh, where I worked as a registrar a long time ago. The, I'm talking about a Scottish audit of uh, surgical mortality. As you can see, 1,100 consultants who are surgeons, anesthetists, International radiologists and intensivists, they contribute to the data about each and every patient uh, over there. And on Wednesday morning, if you are one minute late, it is you won't get even place to sit. So important it is to really keep conducting M and M meeting, morbidity and mortality meeting. So if you can, this is my third question. If you can add to your answer, how many in how often in your department do you have morbidity and mortality meeting? every month. If you can reply that, that will I'll be really indeed grateful. Myself and Gita will take up that, uh, the need for uh, how we learn, how to conduct that, and what is the importance of morbidity and mortality meeting. And Dr. Pata would know that this was something which was very regular when we worked with the, uh, somebody no less than Prof. Samir Nandi as a senior resident and as a junior resident at Ames Delhi. So Gita, I want to make a comment on that. Sorry, I didn't really I thought yeah had no no that, yeah. that that's okay I I just wanted to come come going back to the you know like the basic qualities of communication basic aspects of communication you know it, it's very important you know the how how the human behaves you know when they come across as something endangers them how they behave some people behave in an angry situation. Some people just wreck out in sobbing. And some people, they will show them in the form of a violence. You know, there are different forms of human behavior when the bad news come to them, okay? And also some become very, very defensive and shelled out as well. So as a doctor, you know, I have gone through the training, you know, my undergraduate, postgraduate, even until I came to this country, whenever the patient used to ask questions, I used to become very defensive mm -hmm. without realizing it is not the patient is against you. It is the patient, how they are behaving for the, about the news of their, their patient. Okay. How they are, the, how the relatives are behaving for the, of the news of, the you know, bad news about their patients okay so the first thing is very important as a doctor to not to become defensive trying to put yourself in their shoes and yeah. think if i would have had that bad news how i would have behaved with other person then you would understand where they come from 
okay you have to try to match the frequency of that patient level in terms of understanding how much they can understand what is their knowledge how much you can give that knowledge in that how much they are able to receive or do they need a little bit break and ask them to come back you know after having coffee tea or some water to accept more you know and to to understand more news about you know about the uh, about their health or the patient's health so you need to understand the frequency of the patient or the frequency of the relatives you need to match that and then break the bad news by doing that you are going to avoid so much of misunderstanding between the patient and the doctor you cannot imagine how much you are going to avoid misunderstanding and you have to be calm you have to always have an eye there are few things you know verbal and non verbal communication okay even the verbal may only contribute to 10% yeah, of your okay. whole communication your non verbal communication yeah. is very very important yeah. okay trying to yeah. having an mm -hmm. eye contact mm -hmm. having an open arm okay making them feel comfortable offering them some drink and listening to them even just by listening to them they feel very much respected they they feel that the doctors are empathetic to them they are able to understand what they are going through it is a very vulnerable situation for the patient and patient relatives these are nothing but just the human attitude towards the another human attitude if we know these basics everything becomes very smooth sir you can go ahead i just wanted yeah. to get to the bad no, basics no. right uh, thank thank you ramesh geeta uh, again uh, quite a lot to cover in a short time that's why i'm uh, moving yeah. a bit faster there so uh, this is one of th that picture which uh, you know akshay kumar he uh, with him we developed that and long time ago when we were working in uh, in 2012 in janswasa sayog we realized that high quality care can be provided even with very meager resources and that time we realized that why not really take that kind of ethos and the training of the staff to uh, lucknow delhi or madras so hence Uh, it was at the time in in remote parts of uh, uh, central india we conceptualized this course and later on prof sam simishra aims director he asked us to really, uh, he commissioned that course and he mentions that you know he uh, as a director he received lots of lots of complaints the complaints were of course it happens when the uh, outcomes are suboptimal or less than expected he said that many of those complaints were about how the staff and the doctors dealt with them like uh, they were saying somebody was dead in the emergency or some uh, similar kind of a acute admission area and the on the other side uh, uh, the doctors were laughing so i know uh, we all need to have life we need, but certainly uh, it is as geeta prof geeta shetty mentions the need for non verbal communication the way we conduct ourselves is so crucial sorry i'm not really trying to be here you know say cheesy talks and uh, emphasize on those issues Uh, more than it is necessary shall we just move further then so uh, i'll give you the example of acute critical care course why this course surgeons are not really very good in identifying and managing unexpected adverse events and uh, how many of you have really seen a situation wherein one of our surgical patients has had cardiac arrhythmia we gave a, a call to the uh, to the uh, and as there is to the cardiologist or intensivist and uh, of course uh, most of surgeons like you and me cannot really become intensivist but certainly we need to be endowed we need to have skills that we can identify those rhythms we can really treat that and uh, you just can't really expect the intensivist to come and work on a cadaver we need to keep the patient alive even now at the neurological ward in top institutes in india uh, do get a call to the nsds please come and put the tube so do the patients need uh, do we need tube to survive no we need oxygen simple measures which you and we can implement uh, we know theoretically yes we need oxygen but uh, most of us are not really confident and competent in saving these patients from dying of very simple issues so this kind of course is really meant for uh, uh, you know for any doctor whether surgical medical 
gynecological doctors or the orthopedic doctors or any medical doctors. And I can say that quite a large number of those uh, uh, attendees have been uh, gynecology uh, registrars and consultants. And I, I can also mention that in 2014, uh, the uh, gynae oncology department in uh, near Newcastle in Gateshead, they asked us to really start CRISP course there. And it has become compulsory for all the gynae oncology specialists in UK because they manage their bowel adhesions and any bowel rupture or any uh, surgical issues with the abdomen. They manage themselves rather than calling GI surgeons or the, uh, the general surgeons. So it is really the important, it's so crucial to have very uh, important life-saving skills for these patients. So the focus is not on uh, the uh, knowledge transfer. In fact, we do not give any new knowledge in this course. It is actually to develop skills. And very important part, I can tell you as a patient, uh, over the last two years, I've had few hospital admissions for two different problems. Uh, only about four or five percent of the time, I, it was a consultant surgeon or consultant physician who spoke to me, who explained to me. 95% of the time, I can say with confidently, was really the time of the care and the advice and the uh, the discussion happened with the nurse practitioners, matron, physiotherapist. So all I'm trying to say is that not just us, but we are as good as our nurses, nurse practitioners, uh, and the nurse clinicians in, uh, who need to be talking the same language, that the inability to kill, inability to maintain air kills faster than inability to maintain ventilation, which is B, which kills faster than inadequate circulation, which is C. So we all need to be really uh, speaking from same hymn sheet, hymn sheet. Gita, do you want to add on to that? Do you want to make comment on that? The need for nurses uh, or the paramedical staff and the uh, the uh, physiotherapists, all those people in your team who are so crucial because as a consultant, uh, you won't be able to deliver effectively if you don't have your team well prepared. Any comment? That, that's exactly, you know, like it is a teamwork. Anything is a teamwork. Uh, we always say the surgery is just one third part of our whole process of the patient care. And the one third is the preoperative care and one third is the postoperative care, you know, peri and postoperative care. If the other, you know, bit of uh, one third and one third doesn't go well, how much ever well technically you are good, it becomes irrelevant. There's no point in doing a surgery coming and out and saying that surgery was successful, but the patient died. Doesn't make any sense why the patient died. Maybe the peri and post-operative care wasn't good then, if you're technically sound. So it is very, very important that pre and pe you know, the perioperative and the post-operative care has to be good. And who are the people who looks after these patients? Your junior doctors, your nursing care. They should be equipped very well. These are the, those are the people who are on the ground. I started with this sentence, okay? It is not the senior doctors who are there on the ground in the middle of the night. It is the junior most person who will be on the ground. They need to know what to do to reduce the mortality and the morbidity of the patient. That takes the hell of long way than anything else. Obviously, the physiotherapist, good. they all have their own inputs. Thank you, sir. That rhymes well with the, what Dr. Grijadat Sharma mentioned. Why I'm showing this slide is that, of course, we do course on uh, how, not just knowledge transfer, but developing skills of analyzing, analyzing literature because 99% of the literature which we read is not going to change your practice. So we need to really find out what I need to really learn, uh, what kind of lessons I need to learn from something which will change my practice. It's a unique skill, very important skill for us to have for all those doctors, whether you are working in remote parts or with meager resources. <laughs> All the more reason we use evidence-based medicine principles. So uh, all I'm trying to say here is that whatever we do should be well supported by the evidence. And the evidence is that the whether it is ATLS, the patient saved from hypoxia and hypovolemia within golden hour, means within first hour of injury, that makes all the difference. And these surgical patients are also trauma patients. So ATLS, of course, focuses on uh, within one hour of injury, whether it's surgical or trauma patient. But it is the ACC with, or CRISP course which will really help you to understand what we need to really do for the whole patient journey. So uh, this is the algorithm. 
And very important part of this is identifying somebody who is at a risk of dying. Identify that problem and resuscitate then and there. Diagnosis is not important uh, at the time. And I'll use the uh, uh, analogy from ATLS. More unwell your patient is in an emergency room, less is the need for investigations like CT scan or uh, X-ray. I'm not saying it is not required. Manage these patients purely based on their physiological principles. If their adjuncts are there, fine, use them. And I'm not saying that uh, do not use them. And uh, But it is the physiological derangement which we need to understand to identify the problem which can kill a patient and treat it then and there. And of course, uh, once the patient is stabilized, then you go for full patient assessment using FD, FG, HIJ. And by the end of it, you decide uh, what is trend, trend of all those physio physiological parameters. Can I invite uh, comments from you all? What actually is the physiological parameter which is the most important, which is the most sensitive parameter in our physiological observations, which we need to keep in mind when uh, we are looking at a trend of a patient being well or unwell. So if you can type in the chat, that will be great. And let's move further. So it is, as I said, the diagnosis, final diagnosis is not important. It is the saving these patients during the time when they are unwell following A, B, C, D, E. And I have uh, Rick Dodd, our NSRS uh, with whom I work. He says, Ajay, for anybody dealing with patients who are unwell, surgical or medical, patients in ICU, HDU or on the ward, this is the most important equation. Delivery of oxygen is dependent only on two things, cardiac output and oxygen content of the blood. No more, no less. And that oxygen deficit has to be kept as short as possible. Again, uh, you know, we all need intensivists and SRS to manage these patients, but really they would not be able to work on caregivers. We need to save them. You and me, whether you are senior star or consultant or junior or intern on the ward. So that's what uh, I am really emphasizing it again and again, because longer the oxygen deficit, more the oxygen deficit, more will be the organ dysfunction, which will lead to higher systemic inflammatory system response and poorer would be the outcome. So we need to have leadership uh, role in us because as an intern, as a junior, I would be leading the team. And of course, you are not alone at three o'clock or four o'clock in the morning. If you really think patient, you really need to uh, have the opinion or a consultant need to be seeing your patient and be, do so. There's no never a wrong time to call a consultant or your senior star, oh, please come and help me. Uh, in 81, 45 kids lost their life from Kudubina tragedy. Professor Gode, HOD of anesthesia, told us 44 could have been saved by BLS. And that was only, this structure is only four kilometers away from Sardajan and Ames, two huge hospitals. Have we learned our lesson? No. This is the manual which we started uh, uh, in 2014. We wrote that and we use it for, uh, you know, training. Any one of you, I'll send the copy of it to uh, Dr. Vidya and she can really forward it to you all. And of course, just reading is not enough. It is the skills which you need to acquire. Uh, again, one of the pictures from the tribal area in Central India, we, at times we forget that behind every patient who is coming to hospital, many of them may have to travel for three or four days. And simple pneumonia, so-called simple pneumonia got complicated by pyothorax need chest tube, need chest physiotherapy involving the whole family. But uh, all I'm trying to say is that even with meager resources, if we uh, apply simple principles of scientific medicine, it is possible to achieve very good outcomes. That's what I'm trying to say. So it is not just talking airway and breathing by lecture. It is surgeon like me, although anesthetists, I'm not an anesthetist. I am not expert in intubating patients, but by stepwise approach, chin lift, jaw thrust, oropharyngeal airway, using abu bag mask properly. And if that is not working or anesthetist is, is not really arrived, then using the eye gel or LMA, which uh, any one of us can really put it if we have got some practice of it. At least 350 lives are saved on the streets of uh, UK because the paramedics are able to place the LMA or eye gel properly. So 
So I've got theoretical knowledge of putting endotracheal tube. If I'm in remote parts of Rajasthan or some remote island and I don't have an SRS, somebody needs it, I'll put endotracheal tube. But in the hospital practice, we all should be able to have these skills of saving these patients before expert help arrives. Um, how many of you have seen uh, arrhythmia, somebody having in shock and uh, starting, for example, let's say inotropic support without even optimizing preload, without addressing uh, the contractility, which is affected by three things. I know ideally it should be interactive, which that's what we do in ACC. Hypoxia, hypercarbia, acidosis, three most important things which you and me can do uh, to really uh, save these patients from problems of contractility. And of course, after ensuring preload is optimized, after making sure the contractility is really addressed, then we can, would think of using vasoactive drugs. Again, I'm not trained to use that, but certainly I know whom to call, whose help to take. But I would be able to take the help of anesthetist or intensivist only when I know which patient really needs and how it needs to be uh, achieved. So hence, the need for us to be able to talk about simple principles of applied physiology, principles for looking after these patients who got cardiac dysfunction. Order sensorium, again, uh, uh, you know, of course, uh, sometimes you can have patients with CVA or intracranial issues, but in a surgical ward or post-trauma patients, most important reason for altered sensorism is hypoxia, hypercarbia, acidosis. And of course, very common it could be uh, uh, sepsis in those patients. So do we really need neurologists or neurosurgeons to, to come and see them? But before we really need, we need to really rule out apply the simple principles of ACC or CRISP, CRISP or ATLS or ALS, whatever the problem uh, uh, course you have done to really uh, identify those problems and sort that then and there. So uh, four principles, four key thresholds in the management of sepsis. Like if I give the example of, for example, I'm just looking at the time, uh, how do you address these uh, issues related to dynamics? If I can take you to the physics of your intermediate or plus two level, like you would say like uh, V is equal to U plus AT and S is equal to UT plus half AT square and V square is U square plus two S. So any problem of dynamics given, if you know these three critical threshold, you can sort it, whether it is a, on Mars or in space or underwater or the surface of the earth. Say so bring the problem, I'll sort it. If you know the, those three critical thresholds, Similarly, in sepsis, I didn't suspect sepsis. And uh, that is number first step. If you suspect sepsis and institute the treatment straight away, uh, give the antibiotics within golden hour. And uh, number two, give the antibiotics as uh, early as possible within golden hour. And each hour delay would increase the mortality by 8.6%. So how many interventions in medicine and surgery you and me know of which would change the mortality figure by 8.6%. And still, it, we miss it. And it happens in healthcare system, even in UK. Number three, uh, optimize the patient's uh, physiology within six hours. Surviving sepsis campaign. Within six hours, you and me can optimize their physiology, means optimize the oxygen delivery to tissues. Number four, do not let the sun set or sunrise on the sepsis. So if I'm just giving this exa example of Jan Swasayog, this patient came with four days of peritonitis and uh, he uh, had potassium of something like 2.8. The anesthetist didn't have a ventilator there in tribal area. So he said, no, I can't really anesthetize this patient. This patient will not survive. I don't have ventilator. So what we do, uh, doing using Hassan's technique, which you do for laparoscopic hernia or lap uh, cholecystectomy, under local anesthesia, you can place a big hose pipe, which is Mellicott's catheter. Uh, use the washout of uh, 10 liters of uh, saline, warm saline, throughout the uh, for next 12 hours, and it is it would take care of the patient's pain and uh, optimize him within 12 hours. Uh, correct his potassium or all, all other fluid electrolyte imbalances. By next day, this patient would be, uh, you know, uh, the you will find abdomen to be pristine clear. And it required just simple local anesthesia to place that big hose pipe of sepsis. So this is one simple example 
do not let sunset or sunrise on sepsis. That's what I'm trying to say. Just because these uh, uh, women who are multi-purpose worker in Jan Sevasa Sayug are only fifth pass and senior healthcare worker is uh, MSc, doesn't mean that they are inferior. Each and every member of her team is important. Just because somebody is junior doesn't mean he or she is inferior. So each one of us needs to be empowered to really say what is right. And that happens only when there's a learning environment. One of the seven requirements for any uh, GMC says that for any uh, uh, department or any consultant to be education supervisor is to ensure learning environment that can help cannot happen without uh, mutual respect. How can he score hit? Uh, can how can he score six whenever he wants? Uh, it just happens. The more I practice, luckier I get. So it is a repeated practice which will really make us good at it. Again, one hour is too short a time to really uh, show or even make anybody learn how we do it. But I can really say why it is important. That is my purpose. So this algorithm we, we keeps coming back again and again when we do this course. And uh, all I would just say is that ACC provided course is a hands-on experience which we achieve by linking with uh, the, in, the knowledge which uh, our colleagues, our uh, trainees, our residents have, uh, they have acquired. And it has to be interactive. The, pro the methodology is not to give information. It's basically to make them use how to use that knowledge. Uh, I mentioned about a little bit about the need for evidence-based medicine skills to be really, uh, uh, you all need to have those skills and we'll address that some other time. Whether it is ACC or ATLS instructor course, our purpose is to really help our younger colleagues to become better than me, better than Dr. Patla or Dr. Professor Geeta Shetty, so that you all can become better than us. Then only we will say, oh yeah, we are successful. And another is uh, this term coined by uh, me. Uh, I'll address that some other time. We need to keep helping each other, whether during simulated condition or whether during morbid and mortality, helping each other in uh, uh, learning from whatever is happening in our clinical practice. Again, putting a picture from, uh, uh, you know, Professor Ramon Kapoor. Actually, after 20, 30 years, I realized that uh, I should have really followed what uh, uh, you know, one um, doctor, uh, one senior consultant from PGI told me 30 years ago, pay attention to your family as well. All that I'm trying to say, we all need to develop these skills, but that is not everything. Trying to strike a very fine work-life balance is so crucial for us, our effectiveness as a clinician, as a surgeon. I, again, don't have much examples to give right now. But uh, all I can say is that please, please pay attention to that for your own well-being. I am not a good example uh, in that regard, but please learn from my uh, error. And uh, uh, I should have paid heed to the advice given to me by the senior professor who retired from PJ. I'm talking about 30 years ago. What drives us? We don't have to go very far. We have got examples in our own backyard. And all I'm trying to say is that this oath which we got, you know, we took oath uh, uh, when we are given degree, not for self, not for fulfillment of any worldly desire, but solely for the suffering humanity, you know, we'll treat our patient and excel in it. Excel doesn't mean that gaining more marks, trying to outshine someone else. We are all good as good as our team members. So we need to really help each other to become better and better. All I would just uh, do is giving the example of uh, the cricket player here. You can have one Dhuni, five Tandulkars, five Zahir Khans, but you can't win a game if we are not playing as a team. So I thought, uh, uh, you know, uh, this is a very important slide to really show. Uh, uh, can I just invite comments from Professor Geeta Shetty, again from Dr. Vijay Kumar, the expert here, and also from other colleagues. And more so colleagues who are much younger than us, uh, their con comments, questions, we'll try to answer. And we have got Geeta Shetty who will reply all the difficult questions there. <laughs> she Thank passed you. all the entrance exams. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I just wanted to say when it comes to the learning, there is no, nobody called as a bad student, you know. And the teacher has to really understand 
the needs of the student. They have to go to their level. They may not be, you know, if they knew everything already, why would they come to learn from you? Okay, so you have to go to their level and teach them. Once the barrier is taken away between that teacher and the student, and the learning environment will become much more, you know, it will flourish. And the students are able to learn more than what they are need to. Okay, they don't only learn what you impart the knowledge, they also learn, you are like a role model for them. Okay, you are, there's a difference between the teacher and the guru, I, I'm sure every Indian knows about it. Okay, the guru is the one who, who shows the direction, not necessarily teach everything, but shows the direction and also teaches. The teacher is just impart the knowledge. So if you really want to be a guru, then that barrier has to close and make an environment to learn. Loving if you show, one. if the, the way the hierarchical system is there in India, always the students will think they are some more intimidated. They become more timid to even it, ask it's always going to be there, Gita. Everywhere is going to be hierarchical, uh, but uh, really yes. uh, that should not really come in the way of communicating with that, treating everybody. Communicating, equal. treating, uh, yeah. and yeah. teaching and learning. So, this is how we have to. Yeah. Hierarchy yeah. will be there because, you know, because of these gray hairs, we have some more experience, some <laughs> slightly more uh, expertise, but uh, there's no <laughs> doubt about it. But uh, all, yeah, I know we are, I'm not trying to contradict you. All I'm trying to say is that no, hierarchy is right. everywhere, but giving voice to everyone in the team, that is so crucial. I, I know you are focusing on, very importantly, on learning environment, which is very, very crucial. Uh, I'll just give you this uh, great man, Professor Amankur. I was junior in 1980. Uh, maybe Dr. Patta would have heard and met him uh, and many of his contemporaries. He would admit this patient, let's say for, oh, Ajay, I have admitted this patient of acute college studies in the ward. Can you go and see him and tell me? If you disagree with me, I'll go and see him again. And that time I was wondering that my experience in surgery is only four months. There is somebody who has got 40 years of experience. Why is he saying that if I disagree with him? I, of course, I must agree with him. But no, he, he was he, like science has to be very democratic. You know, uh, you know, whatever is the evidence, clinical evidence, and you use that in managing your patient. What are, what are the information you gather? So he's always very happy to really encourage us, each one of us to think independently. That's what we need to really help our younger colleagues to become an independent thinker, whether they're learning the critical appraisal skills, or in future, whenever you get opportunity, talking about what do you do if a surgical patient has got real dysfunction, renal dysfunction? What do you do if a patient, uh, surgical patient has got problems with uh, hyponatremia? It is not that complex, simple approach. We should be able to manage them very safely. Of course, when we are in, uh, there's always expert help in the terms of cardiologists, intensivists, you know, ICU consultants or registrars or NSRIs. But you and me should be able to start treatment well in time before patient comes to further harm. Dr. Girija, Dr. Uh, Vijay Kumar, yeah. Dr. Pata. And Dr. Ajay, if you can stop sharing the screen, we can see everyone better. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I would do that. Yeah, yeah, I would share that. Yeah. Here we go. Thank so you. We have got a few comments here. Some of us uh, Dr. William says some of us doctors think they are gods. Oh yeah, we need to really come out of that uh, god syndrome. Uh, uh, communication skills are very important. Yeah, I can see if you might. Uh, yeah, I know it is recorded. So if you can share that so that we can. There are no questions as such. There are only comments. I've seen those chats. Yeah. Thank you very yeah, much. So it was a wonderful lecture from you. And you rightly pointed out very clearly that the training of our team is very, very important to improve the quality of the perioperative care. So train, educating a surgeon to be a wise enough to participate in the perioperative care is a good attempt and very nice to see the syllabus and everything which you have in your course can really educate the entire team to have a good knowledge in the critical care management of the patient. 
the improvement of the quality in the perioperative care, there are two aspects, according to me, I think, reducing the mortality in a surgical patients and reducing the morbidity in a surgical patient. As you rightly said, this type of critical care training to the surgeons, anesthesiologists, intensivists to take part in the perioperative care of a surgical patient. At the same time, I'd like to know from you, how can we improve the quality of perioperative care in view of reducing the morbidity on our surgical patients? Yeah, Dr. Geeta or Dr. Ajay, which one of you would like to take that question? Because uh, it, it, most of the focus on uh, today's talk was like almost like preventing mortality. Like we were trying to uh, address patients who are rapidly deteriorating. So uh, Dr. Vijay uh, Kumar wants a more nuanced uh, thing about um, how do we prevent uh, morbidity or how do we enhance uh, recovery? Uh, isn't that your question, Dr. Vijay Kumar? Yeah, true. Because if people are involved in educating the perioperative care team, I'd like to know from you people, how can you improve the perioperative care by reducing the morbidity on our surgical patients? Providing training, yeah. uh, making it uh, compulsory for all the surgical trainees to uh, learn and uh, be involved in perioperative care, uh, you know, uh, that's as simple as that. So uh, without those uh, courses, without those competence, we, so we just not only need to achieve competence, but also need, we need to really have confidence. And that needs to be really endorsed that the all the surgical trainees or medical trainees are able to follow a, a standard algorithm and demonstrate that. Yeah, uh, Nalla, would you like to add something? Uh, Nalla has uh, been uh, running um, bariatric uh, surgery unit, like uh, and uh, safely managing morbidly obese patients. So I'm sure he has a pointer or two about preventing morbidity. Yes, Nalla. Uh, thanks, Vidya, and thanks for the lo lovely lecture. Um, yeah, it's true. Uh, when we started off with the more obesity patients, um, I work in a private setup, so time is money. So one of the things we started was ERAS. All of you know ERAS. But then what I realized was ERAS is not effective unless you have a fantastic perioperative room with all facilities, gadgets. And we made it a point the three-fourths of the staff in the perioperative ward, the post-operative ward, I mean, immediately next to the anesthesia operating theater, had the senior-most people. And there will be only juniors, one or two will join into the team. And that's very important to have that going. And the most important thing is, I coming back to the surgeons, I think surgeons have changed a long way. I don't think you need to have the older surgeons to go. Even the newer surgeons don't come and <laughs> see the patients very often in the post-op ward because they go on to the next case and the next case. So the entire brunt falls on the anesthetist. And I feel the anesthetist is the key person who can take a good perioperative care and make sure for the answer which the question for which Vijay Kumar asked, reduce the morbidity. If you want to reduce the morbidity, the anesthetist has to be very careful. He must be sure who's the patient whom is taken out of the theater and what team he has got with him in the period, the post-operative ward. And that team is the team that's going to take care. And so we have more gadgets in the post-operative ward, in the post-operative uh, unit, more than the theater. So that is the way you can decrease the morbidity. Sending them to the ward is just a matter of, you know, uh, later on where we go on rounds and catch up cases which fall in a later phase of delayed secondary problems. But the primary problem, airway, circulation, and respiration. These three, I think you should have a team, and the team has to stay with you. And I always told Vidya, my team has been with me for 18 years. So I'm very grateful. That's how we can reduce morbidity. Yeah, I would you same. all have to have yeah. the training 
everybody should have certification certification is part of the uh, uh, accreditation process but it, it has helped a lot in getting all the new the older people to go through all the acls pals and everything trauma and come out successfully to train the juniors but seniors are very important if you want to reduce morbidity and juniors to be phased in in a manner slowly not straight into the post operative ward you have four juniors and two seniors you are going to land up with more morbidity Thanks. Thank you, Dr. Lenz, Dr. Simon. Uh, I would keep learning from NSRS, keep talking to them, and keep learning from them. Can I invite a comment from Dr. Shiv Singh? He very aptly uh, mentioned many, make many comments here worth reading. And of course, one of those I was also really going to point out somebody with hip fracture, whatever the situation is, they should really be operated within 24 hours, wherever they are, and uh, irrespective of. Um, you know, the conditions. That's the best way of saving them. Shiv Singh, Dr. Shiv Singh, do you want to make some comments on about the training of uh, our residents in providing perioperative care? Hi, Ajay. I'm not been too well. I've got cough and <coughs> so, so, you know, upper respiratory tract infection. So I, that's why I didn't want to come in. But there are two, two different things you're actually talking about. I think uh, one was about a patient who's already had a surgery, has gone to the ward, and there is some sort of deterioration in this case. That's a totally different thing. Then there is another group where you're talking about improving the outcome of patients coming for routine surgery. Now, if you don't identify the patient who are, you know, fit, the patients who are fragile, you cannot optimize them. I think there is a huge tubular vision among surgeons to looking at, I just want to cut. Hmm. Okay, that 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 need to actually go away because you should be able to assess. I know because of our anesthesia group, I know where patients actually have the PAC done on the table. Okay, pre-op assessment is not to be done on the table. Otherwise, how will you recognize the, you know, a critical, I'm not talking about critically ill patient, the patient who's got comorbidities. Now, if you do not control, if you look at the ASA grading, it is based on systemic illness. How well it is controlled or how unwell the patient is with those conditions. If a patient comes with a blood sugar of 300 milligrams, okay, that might be a small thing for a surgeon. They say it doesn't affect my mm -hmm. surgery but it affects the post-operative period, which can actually lead to patient developing infection. Okay, you're providing a milieu which is actually easy for a patient catching infection or you know other complications associated with uh, diabetes. Or so this might be because patient has got microvascular disease, so the healing is not going to be uh, you know better in the post-operative period. So eros is again, I think, which was one thing which was not stressed. In your lecture, which we do actually stress quite a lot, uh, is about the pain management in the post-operative period. Yeah. Okay. Physiology, people don't understand the physiology that a 25-year-old lying down, right, nothing will happen to him, but you have a patient who is 80-year-old who's who is kept lying down in the bed. His, his closing capacity is encroaching a far C. He's going to get atelectasis. If he's going to get atelectasis, he's going to have shunt. If he's going to have shunt, he's going to have hypoxia. Now, you will keep the patient actually lying down. This patient should be actually sitting up on the ward. It's as simple as that. There are very simple things which can be done to patients. You showed, you showed an image of a little child having a chest drain and doing doing the uh, you know, incentive spirometry. I think that was an adult one, not a pediatric one. That is, again another thing. That patient cannot take deep breath if you don't provide good analgesia, and it can be done in a very simple way. The children actually have got a lot of reserve. They will actually do it. So I think you need to actually separate out two things. Talking about patients who are coming for elective surgery, one. Two, patients who have already had surgery, how do you actually recognize these are two totally different and I think a lot of things have been mixed up here. I think there was less clarity. We could have been a lot more clearer in saying what we actually want to provide to the to the surgeons. 
I think I'll, I'll stop with yeah, that. Yeah. Thank you very much, Shiv. Uh, it's so crucial. It's time didn't allow for talking about pain control, but it is so crucial. So, uh, your point is well taken, Shiv. Uh, uh, Dr. Uh, Vijay Kumar, would you like to respond to that? I just want to stress because uh, the perioperative care is not like simply in the immediate post-operative care. It starts from the pre-operative preparation, it goes intraoperatively, and in the post-operative ward, the intensive care it's reduced to reduce the mort mortality. But after that, when the patient goes to the ward, how it, she has to get discharged, and what is the prescription we have to give to improve is quality of life to go back to the work, everything put together is the quality improvement in the perioperative care. For example, when we discharge the patient going home, we are not advising them to have a exercises and also to have a high protein diet after the discharge. And with this high protein diet and exercises, and, exercises. and to reduce the pain for them to be continued after the discharge also, with all these measures, we can make them fit enough to go to their work at the early. So that in that aspects, we have to improve the quality of perioperative care. And it doesn't stop with the immediate post-operative illnesses happening in the intensive care units. If time would have permitted, I thought I think that Dr. Ajay would have covered all these things, but in this half an hour lecture, we could not covered it up and he just concentrated on this immediate post-operative period and at his points are well taken. The training and education is very important to the entire team. The team should know what is going on to the patient, whether the lead person is anesthesiologist or the surgeons or the physicians, the staff nurses and the people around us also should know what we are really doing to the surgical patients. So that type of training and communication skills, the points which they had told should be taken well enough to improve the quality of perioperative care. Thank you very uh, thank much. You. Thank you. Uh, uh, Dr. Punidhar, uh, would you like to say something? No, I think it's a fantastic, uh, very, very important that we stress on the practical aspects. Most of our medical education stresses only on the theoretical bits. And I'm absolutely spot on that we need these CRISP and ACCC courses. The problem in implementation actually for us is, I mean, if you see the background of how the CRISP started, uh, thanks to this, I think it was a football disaster, post yeah, uh, football team disaster somewhere. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so uh, I think the problem we have is of training the trainers, uh, which is the, going to be the biggest struggle for us because, you know, it, these fantastic sessions, we are hoping, uh, you know, empower and um, uh, push people to actually, uh, you know, realize that we have gaps in the senior people uh, because unless we, you know, the we say communication skills, we teach properly, but uh, most of the things that the kids learn as surgeons is, you know, how to get the patient out of the operating room, the fastest, how to hoodwink the anesthetist into, you know, making the patient fit. Uh, so it's in private and uh, public hospitals, they're different problems, which they're, they're learning all the wrong things rather than the right way. So I think uh, we'll have to, you know, put... Uh, practice what we preach or what we want to preach at least we should practice that first uh, and so we need to be so when I try to enlist for an ACLS course here because you know done out of the number of years that I've done it our senior anesthetist in uh, uh, Amrita Faridabad actually said you know this is not meant for your level it's meant for the junior I said if unless you know I know it I'm not going to be able to uh, you know push my younger colleagues to uh, to learn you know so so it's 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 we need to address the senior role models actually to become actual role models thanks uh, lovely lovely i really enjoyed the uh, you know the the points that were made both by the you know on all sides uh, everybody here thanks thank you yeah very important point highlighted uh, dr dhar so eloquently uh, that we all need to really have skills of teaching as well the education principles how we learn why we learn if I, as a teacher, do not understand that, I won't be able to train our younger colleagues. So that's what we address in instructor courses, whether it is ACC or whether it is instructor course for ATLS. 
So yeah, I was just going to say something. I'll just echo what Dr. Shiv Singh says. And I was going to really say that uh, each one of these uh, uh, organ dysfunctions system, uh, what we really learn uh, in ACC or in the CRISP requires actually one hour of discussion, of course, multiplied by 10. And then, of course, uh, that is not enough. It is a skill development we need to really focus on. Of course, we'll come back some other time. So we have Dr. Shiva Pillai, who's logged in from South Africa. How are things uh, over there uh, as far as perioperative care goes, uh, Shiva? No, it, it, it is it, we are struggling. First thing first, you know, uh, we have a thing here where the patient cannot leave the recovery room without uh, without proper instructions. We found that in our m, &M meetings, the most important thing was that the communication of to tell the ward what to do and what not to do. And that was a big thing. Then now we, we, we almost computerized, everybody walks around with, a, with an iPad. So we are forced to write uh, write down everything and communicate everything that you need to, 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 to the ward. To get for particular operations, particular protocols in place, such that the nursing staff get used to it becomes very important. The most, the, 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 we found that the quality of the nurses that are coming out now is, is, is really weak. And so therefore now you need to almost like say to them, uh, follow this for this patients or who are coming out for, I do seizures most, most, most of the time. I have written a post-operative seizure protocol I, or I do, if I do a McDonald's suture, I've got a post-operative McDonald protocol. And I think that if you start teaching protocols and, and teaching similar things, then people get used to it. When you get too many different uh, protocols, then the staff also get confused. But uh, it is recognized that it's called the golden hour. And if you don't uh, do things during the golden hour, as you said, you can get the best specialist after that. You'll be calling them to a cadaver. So, yeah. yeah, we really need to save these patients from going to ward to HDU, from HDU to ITU. If we implement simple measures in the right time, and rather than very heroic measures, which need expert care of uh, intensivists or the anesthetists, we need to save them. Dr. Geeta, you have your hand up. Uh, you wanted to add something? Yes, yeah. yes, I did. You just I want to comment, you know. Yeah, definitely surgery. I think I started with my second sentence. Surgery is just one third, preoperative is one third, and peri, you know, post operative is one third of the whole care of the patient. Certainly, that cannot be taken away. We need to know about each and everything about the patient before we operate. There is no doubt in that, okay? The the main reason, the application of ACC, not necessarily just for the surgical patients. It is for any ill patients on the ward. How to look after the physiology of the patient. That is what this you know, lecture was perhaps intended to do. You know, maintaining the proper airway, you know, making sure the breathing is okay without having any problems, you know. Then the third thing is the circulation, keeping the patient alive until we find an appropriate specialty to come in. That was the main aim. For this can be applied to any surgical, any ill patients, not necessarily just a surgical patient, even in the medicine ward, even in emergency, after the one hour of the golden rule of the, you know, uh, what we call it as an ATLS, after the one hour golden, uh, golden hour, the ACC applies here when the patient is stabilized, if the patient goes away to the ward, if the patient deteriorates, who is going to take care of patient, how we can apply what, what how we can apply ACC with uh, to reduce the mortality and morbidity of this patient. It is, you know, th this can be used in a di different different way. But if you are in the surgical ward, if you have your own team, definitely they should be knowing about the preoperative con you know, problems of the patients, 
and during the operation the same residents will be covering i believe and then the post operative as well that makes it more much more simplified than attending the de novo patient on the ward in any other you know scenarios that is what i wanted to comment uh, thank, thank you, you. Dr. Rita. Uh, we have Dr. Anjali Dawle, who's a surgeon and also has her own hospital in a tier two city in India. Dr. Anjali, how how do you uh, manage your post-operative patients? Dr. Anjali Dawle, are you there? Right. We have a, I, I didn't understand the question, but I I hope the people on the panel understand. There's a question saying how to negate surgeon's response, like that my surgical time is 15 minutes for patients, uh, like having critical pathophysiological parameters that may lead into irreversible injury. Uh, uh, Dr. Dilip Kumar, if you could just actually speak out because... I'm not, I, I, your question is not very clear to me, and uh, I'm not sure if the panelists also are um, can, very clear about the question. Yeah, yeah. Uh, effective ward rounds are so crucial in identifying patients who are deteriorating. Almost 85% of patients who face a, a cardiac or cardiorespiratory arrest on the wards can be identified if you look back in uh, because of uh, you know that trend. If we can identify that. So they can be really identified and really be uh, saved from going into that uh, state. And I was just asking the most sensitive physiological parameter is respiratory rate. So if somebody has got tachypnea, let's say over 20, there's no way I should be really ignoring that. It is not sensitive. It is sensitive. It is not specific at all. There can be problem with A, problem with B or with C or with metabolic issues. I do not know. But certainly a repeated... Uh, observation would really help us identify those patients who are deteriorating. I'll give you an example of uh, somebody who has got, uh, let's say, colorectal injury. Repeated clinical examination of somebody who has got colorectal injury is as sensitive and as reliable as triple contrast study. And that I can really give you the example from trauma of abdomen. So how important that is, uh, that really emphasizes it well. Is, does that answer your question? With you. I guess. Um, yeah. Thank you, I think Dr. Vidya. Okay. Uh, about Dilip. Oh, he's here now. He can, yeah, he Dilip, can, could you just uh, yeah. actually explain what yeah. your question was? If it's already answered, then uh, that's fine. No, no. Actually, it's, it's not been answered. Actually, my question is, well, like I've seen in 20 years, a surgeon, like we discussed as a, to prevent the perioperative morbidity, I've seen the surgeons most of the time they were saying like I have a five ten minutes of job even the critical patient. I just give you a sim simple example. Last is with the scenario thirty five year male having a tracheostomy just for a ENT pathology. His platelets were thirty five and he still wanted a biopsy in a tracheobronchial tree. So I told him he says just my a five ten minutes job just take the tissue. So see how the surgeons respond all the time in your life. They were more focused because I, I can understand surgeons, they really are only concerned about their surgical point, but they don't, don't look into the, around the patient complete body. So I have seen in since 20 years, the same challenges. Then how to negate, because surgeon is with us, because how to negate with them to make them happy, to understand for the patient, rest of the body. Thank you. If the all these surgeons have gone through proper internship program that they manage their patients, on their own as intern, as rather than really relying, if somebody cardiologist will come and see, or one of the respiratory medicine will, especially will see, or one of the intensive will solve this problem. That's why these happen. So we are really, uh, uh, we you know, as a surgeon, I do, I can say, as we all know, uh, I would echo that, that it's just the lack of uh, training and lack of understanding. It's the whole overall, uh, you know, we are doctors first, surgeons later. Uh, Vidya, ma'am, uh, can I yes, answer? Yes, yes, 
uh, as the uh, whatever discussion is going on that uh, surgeon many of the times do not think of the uh, scenario uh, regarding the patient as a whole instead of only the surgical site and related problems uh, yes it is a uh, true uh, to some extent many of the times even last week i have seen one my known patient uh, was having a chronic trigeminal neuralgia uh, five to six surgeons, neurosurgeons, or uh, they have advised do not opt for the surgery. There are many other ways like radio frequency ablation, etc., etc., plain kidney, uh, pain entity uh, clinic handling. But uh, patient underwent an operation with a newcomer uh, surgeon. He has operated the patient. Patient first post-op day patient was doing well. Second post-op day patient uneventually went into an unconscious state and the events happened on. And uh, in within 1.5 months, patient had a death. So this whatever discussion is going on, it is true up to some extent that even though disease or a surgery is benign, but patient as a whole should be thought of whether we can give a radical cure or not. And as said by the singh sir, that it is a part of your education. It is a part of your understanding. It is a part of imagining the science that I would have been, if I would have been in the place of this patient or my close relative in this close scenario, what would be my decision? That is important, I think. Uh, thank you, Anjali. I'd also like your comments about Challenges of uh, perioperative quality, perioperative care in a uh, smaller setting. Uh, madam, uh, uh, quality or challenges in a small setup, even though I am having a small setup, but uh, God has blessed me with an anesthetist husband. That is the greatest <laughs> gift. Uh, so uh, quality care and uh, intensive care and a uh, perioperative and intraoperative care, even now with leave, leaving with my husband, even I can opt. Now this is a ASA grade one, two, three, and <laughs> we should not go for our operation in our setup. I could read realize that so challenges are definitely there back madam but as sir has said we need to educate the surgeons about how to calculate the risk as a whole like like airway breathing like intubation like laryngeal mask airway and uh, even in today's scenario many of the setups do not have the workstation also they are still on the boil apparatus. So many pitfalls are there and still there is much more time required to come to overcome these challenges definitely. But if education spreads, if anesthetist and surgeon go hand in hand, many of the time these challenges can be uh, reduced to some extent, madam. Thank you. Thank you, Anjali. Uh, Puneet, you have your hand up. You want to say something? Yeah, the same point that you raised about, uh, you know, what, how you can manage in small settings or small towns. Uh, there's a fantastic solution I saw in, uh, uh, you know, if you cut the, uh, India into two, uh, north, south, east, west, the center point is, a you know, a place called Dhule. Uh, it's a little upmarket from Ganyari and, you know, those kind of places, but uh, uh, small enough that you cannot run, you know, small time uh, individual. Most of these places are small places have individual practices. A single neurosurgeon, a one you know, uh, cardiac surgeon doing vascular surgery uh, and things like that. So what they did in this town, there's this a surgeon. His son actually came to me as an MCH student, and I went back to inaugurate his center. And I was very impressed. They had the entire town and the affiliated towns, uh, which is uh, you know, it's about I think 50 kilometers from Nasik, a much bigger town. Didn't have all the facilities that they could provide by consortiumizing. Uh, so they you know one of the uh, uh, neurosurgery centers where the MR was there on the first floor of that they set up an ICU so they uh, you know all of them contributed and set up an ICU uh, employed a, a few anesthetists or critical care people and everybody was able to do much more than they were capable of uh, you know I know it not, doesn't address that issue directly but I think that helped them teach all each other uh, about all the problems they had they even had an uh, uh, oxygen tent, which I was very surprised that hyperbaric oxygen therapy was available in that small town, which in Amrita Cochin we got uh, several years later. So I think it's possible if we look at innovative solutions, out of the box solutions. Like I know uh, the Ganyari and uh, you know in uh, Gudlur, they have uh, fantastic solutions for a lot of simple problems. So I think we ne do need to have Indian problems, uh, uh, indigenous uh, uh, solutions for these problems. Thanks. Thank you, Puneet. Uh, 
uh, amazing uh -huh. Dr. Puneet Dharma, how much you have said. JSS, uh, many, many dozens and dozens of innovations there, uh, which of course one day we should be able to revisit that. Uh, fantastic examples. And it is high time that uh, wherever, you know, remote areas where some of our colleagues are working with meager resources are providing high quality care, uh, we really need to really uh, see, learn from them, you know, catalog it and uh, publish it, uh, help them to publish. That is very important. So otherwise, such kind of examples will remain in silo and none of us would really get to know about it. Uh, absolutely. We are trying, we were trying for the JSS model to be shown in the people we admire uh, section. But unfortunately, since they broke up, uh, it you know, it's very difficult to get any of them uh, to be admired, they I, I've never seen such a lot of people who don't want to be, you know, uh, been in the limelight. But I really agree with you. We really need to show that because the lessons all of us can learn at all levels, not just in small small centers. Stanley Medical College, Madras, whose logbook I showed uh, when I went there in 1988, and that's still with me, sets highest quality example in hand surgery. Nowhere in the world you'll go to see 60, 70 operations of a hand and feet any day. I'm not a hand surgeon, but I really miss the kind of high quality with meager resources they are able to provide. Decades uh, after Dr. Geeta, you had your hand up. You wanted to say something? I, I, I did. I just wanted to um, uh, answer, uh, have a comment to the other young doc doctor who was talking about the surgeon's attitude and behavior. It, it, there has to be a cultural change. It has to change. It has to come from the seniors who have gone, you know, a whole wheel and understanding cutting is no, not all about it, you know, the pre-operative care, post-operative care, and then comes the technical bit. Technical bit, even if you ask, uh, you know, Yeah, all Geeta is saying that uh, no, uh, perioperative care and we have got NSRS intensive. We need to keep learning from them, keep talking to them. And that is the way I prepared for my final FRCS exam. Easy. Uh, Shiva, Shiva, you have your hand up. You wanted to add something? Yeah, uh, maybe I didn't answer the question. We have something here that is unique. Uh, maybe I don't know whether it's unique or not. First, the intention, the original intention was that the people are doing unnecessary operations and commercialism in medicine and then starting to do too many interventions. It's similar to what was said that, you know, suddenly you think you know, to operate, is it the best option or is something else? So to prevent uh, unnecessary things happening, there's a whole thing started off where, it, where you have to get pre-authorization. So initially it was started off to prevent from the medical funds, preventing doctors from doing things, into, you know, to uh, over, to prevent over servicing. But eventually it evolved to something that is independent where now before an operation is done, a panel of people looks at it and says, okay, we're going to give authorization for this one. They give the authorization for that. They actually write a full protocol to say, if the operation is done, this is what we want done. Post-op, this is what we want done. The physiotherapy must be included. Early mobilization is included. Diet advice is included. So everything comes into a package and you've got a group of people that will give the best protocol for that. That's what I was talking about, protocols when I was saying. So I just realized I didn't give context to protocols because so now when every time we get a pre-authorization, uh, what is going to be done, and what is going to be done post-op is also advised so it's not just left to the surgeon alone to do that. The second thing that happened that, that, that has helped us is that surgeons don't like to admit mistakes. So when some things go south, uh, then the thing is given to the eye care team to look after the patient in which then there is a separate team that looks after the patient uh, made up of other specialists, internists and others like that. And they actually then decide whether the patient can go back to theater or anything, but they stabilize the patient and make sure that the patient is well. But we found that the pre-op thing became very important because it wrote the protocols of what needs to be done. It didn't go to the extent of saying what diet should be given to a patient and, and uh, et cetera, what physiotherapy should be given to a patient after the operation is done. It started off to prevent commercialization, but it also gone up now to improve patient care. I don't know if that is something that is being done anywhere else, but we have that in different hospitals to just 
and, and you have a hospital peer board. First, it was given to the anesthetist, and the anesthetist was supposed to be in the part of the pre med to look at it. But the anesthetists are very reluctant to say, no, 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 let's not do this or let's do this because they don't want to offend the surgeon because it's their commercial business because they're dependent on the surgeon for, for choosing them as an anesthetist. So now it's an independent team that does pre-authorization, but the pre-authorization goes beyond pre-authorization. It goes to what should happen during the operation, post-op care, and uh, the best uh, kind of care that should be given to a patient post-op. Thanks. Yeah. Quality control and uh, data keeping, electronic data keeping, although it doesn't have costs involved in it, is so crucial that really make our medical care and learning from it very robust. Uh, only two weeks ago, when we were doing general club with Jan Swatsayseo, we realized that patients coming for uh, you know getting prescriptions of antibiotic from here and there everywhere uh, is the biggest reason for uh, antibiotic resistance. And the simplest way of making sure what the patient before coming to you has got it, if it is on the records. And now uh, it is not so difficult to achieve that, but that is for some other time in future. Yeah, we are almost out of time. Uh, Radha Krishna would like to come in now. Yeah, at the outset, I think I should uh, commend uh, Dr. Ajay Sharma uh, for his passion and uh, uh, zeal in teaching uh, perioperative medicine to youngsters in India. That is, is giving back to the country, uh, you know, which gave something to him in the beginning. And uh, having said that, as Dr. Geeta I was rightly pointing out, we all like, surgical trainees are more bothered about anatomy and never about physiology. Physiology is never learned or understood, especially surgical physiology. And that's the reason why we have such, uh, you know, huge uh, defect in this perioperative care. Now, this we all should understand that there's a huge lacuna in Indian medical education in the area of perioperative care, both in undergraduate education as well as postgraduate surgical education. You know, I, I know Vidya remembers as an undergraduate in MBBS, we all were taught how to intubate, how to do a cut down. Even if it's not, uh, we went gone to another specialty, we're called back because our turn, we are made to do all these and have a logbook signed. But now with 250 students per year in MBBS and about 60, 70 MS students, I don't know what is their thought, what is taught to them. It's very, very sad that most uh, surgeons, the present era, can't do an ECG, can't interpret an ECG, can't intubate a patient, can't put a central line, you know, all those life-saving measures, they just do not know. And, uh, you know, even in a undergraduate, uh, postgraduate training, even super specialty training, the ICU postings are 15 days you know, for uh, the students. And that time they do, they make use for uh, completing their thesis and stuff like that. They think that this hot medicine is not nothing to do with us. And so that's the situation where we are in. Now, who will bell the cat in India? In, in other words, who will teach these, this group of uh, young surgeons and undergraduates perioperative medicine? Uh, who will form a team? The team comprised of a surgeon or anesthetist or intensivist? I, I really do not know because, you know, it's good that you are coming all the way to India and trying to uh, teach people here. But I think uh, the National Medical Commission or something should constitute a team to do this unless that is done and this is made mandatory in our academic course. I think a perioperative care by surgeons will remain the same. Uh, yeah, yeah I, I just want to make a point. You made it really clear, um, uh, Dr. Radhakrishnan. You know, it is, it is very, very important. First, we are doctors, then surgeons. You know, we, we need to know the basic aspects of the medicine, the physiology, then comes the anatomy. So it, it is very, very important. I believe even before leaving the medical school, the student should be taught all of this, this ACC, ATLS, all of this should have been already, you know, introduced to them, including the communication course, okay? Introduced to the um, communication course uh, should have been done even before they leave the med school. We are not preparing our students well. We are leaving them in the wild without being, having a good wings. That is why they face these kind of situation they become defensive and they take the wrong step. 
who are the culprits we seniors are the culprits because we are not equipping them we as a parents you know we we equip our children before going to the university with everything okay when they go out home are we doing the same thing to our medical me medical students so we should come up with certain these courses yes we are doing a satellite you know we are trying to make them aware so ideally it should have been introduced at the intern level yeah. and yes, they should know. have some means to redo this course again every two years or three years to have a refreshment so that they haven't lost anything what they have learned even though they go into a surgery plastic surgery urology whichever branch they go even rheumatology first they are doctors yeah. So they should have some um, means of refreshing their skills every three years or four years, you know, giving the certificate until they finish their postgraduate in whatever yeah. they are doing. Something should come up. Yeah. And only as the seniors, we should take that step. Yeah. Although we, the seniors may not have an appetite to learn all this thing and then bring them into their practice. But at least what we can do as a seniors is to facilitate this yeah. learning yeah. for our juniors so that for betterment for our own generation yeah. we need to know when we are sick who is going to look after us these yeah. are the guys who doesn't know anything yeah. i feel I've sorry for there. ourselves we are in the situation yeah. that we you know we have been given into their hands <laughs> yeah. regularly i need to demonstrate that i have got enough bls skills otherwise i say oh i do this so many courses no doctor you need to show us that you can do it properly we went to the health minister three years ago with the nun uh, and the ICMR director. Somehow it didn't work. But certainly I can tell you the uh, one place in KMC Maglore, we didn't have really teach BLS there. They were excellent at it. Number two, AFMC, group dynamics and their ability to deal with all sorts of arrhythmias uh, and respiratory embarrassments. They were class apart compared to any doctors from civil area. I am to say that. Uh, of course, uh, we in civil uh, medical practice do have uh, our own strong points, but uh, the way they can't get degree in AFMC unless they really demonstrate the skills they learned in ALS and ACLS. It is compulsory. I don't know why elsewhere it cannot be made. Yeah. I think it's a question of when they when uh, when they are out there at the front or in war, uh, everyone knows that there's going to be no one but themselves. So this is exactly. uh, I think, yeah. So everyone, each one of us should learn as if there's going to be no one but ourselves. I think that's the only way. Uh, uh, so it's like a repeated uh, story that why do anesthetists not check the mes machine as safe, as uh, meticulously as a pilot checks the aircraft? Because yeah, if the aircraft cr right. crashes, the pilot also will die. Whereas, uh, and many other people will die. Whereas when something goes wrong, it happens only to the patient. So that way, I think... Uh, 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 I mean, the armed forces, everyone knows that when they are posted out there, they are the only ones that they're going to be yeah. there. They better be good at it. <laughs> yeah, there's 150,000 people, one lakh, one and a half lakh people die on the roads in India. And that is more than the five-year casualty of Iran war. So we all are facing like war-like situation. Anyway, it is endemic. You're right. So, uh, Dr. Vijay Kumar, your closing comments, sir. Thank you very much. Good listening. We all enjoyed the entire lecture and we learned many points. Thank you very much for marvelous medicine for giving us all this opportunity. Thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Ajay Sharma, uh, Dr. Geeta Shetty for taking time out from your working day. Thank you, Shiv, for joining. Thank you. And uh, um, thank you, Dr. Vijay Kumar, for staying well beyond our uh, uh, planned time. We'll meet again next week with another episode of Marvelous Medicine. Till then, take care and stay safe. Uh, good night. Thank you.